So, Brian, you've been incredibly successful and proficient for so many years. And to do that, you had to know or understand how to, to find, to spot, and to work with people who are incredibly creative, talented, uh, driven. Uh, and um, so, 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 so my question is, how do you know whether it's the right person or the right story? Well, our businesses are very similar, very, very similar. We're dealing with subjectivity all the way. We're dealing with ideas that are like ether that we're trying to later someday turn into a solid. And so you can't really know. Um, so people think in our business, people often think, well, I, tr I trust his instincts or well, let's trust our own instincts. And I always thought that was kind of bullshit because I think you can only trust informed instincts. And so I went on this journey of um, doing these curiosity conversations over 35 years ago, which helped. Um, so basically what they are is for, after graduating college, I asked myself this rhetorical question. I said, uh, what did I learn? And I said, thought to myself, I didn't really learn anything. Um, and I did go to USC right nearby, by the way. Um, in any event, so I thought to myself, well, how can I learn? How can I, you know, uh, disrupt my comfort zone? How can I go about doing this? So I created a discipline that every two weeks for over 35 years, I go reach out to somebody that I don't know on a subject I know very little about. And so by doing that, and reach, you know, I met with Edward Teller, who is the father of the hydrogen bomb. I met with Steve Jobs. I met with Elon very early on. Of course, Jeff Bezos, uh, uh, Reed Hastings, and Reed Hoffman. But uh, many princes and die, Salk. Prince. Sorry? And Jonas Salk. And a Jonas Salk, of course, my childhood uh, hero. Yes. Which I, and when I, I was so nervous when I met Jonas Salk that I actually, approaching him, instead of shaking his hand, I threw up on him. <laughs> I, I literally, I barfed, I was so nervous. So, um, yeah, Jonas Salk, good. Um, but by meeting all of these different people and learning about their worlds, it gave me not expertise, but a familiarity and comfort with the people and the worlds themselves and their vocabulary. So it does give you a better sense of detection as to whether an idea is an old idea or a new idea or an old idea that needs a new perspective or a fresh lens. It helps you understand like who is full of shit and who isn't full of shit on, on a particular subject. It had me you know, think of questions that I would have never thought of like, when I try to meet a, when I meet a director, if I have to pick a director and have to choose him, I say, or or her, I say, well, what does it look like? And then they say, what do you mean by that? Well, what will it look like when you make it? What will that shot look like? And and that answer will give you so much information. So that's sort of how I know better than most. Uh, yeah, I think in our who business, to bet on. we call it pattern recognition. Uh, Yesterday, yeah. actually, we had Ron Conway, who is a big angel investor, in the room, and he was talking about all the criteria that he uh, that that he cares about in an entrepreneur that he's developed over the years. Because the more you see, the more you know, and you're able to detect, and that's what you've done. Yeah, well, he has, and like you, have tremendous pattern, and Mark have tremendous pattern recognition because just the volume of incoming and outgoing is just it's it's just. I'm awestruck by it. Quite so, quickly. so tell me about a time where you were totally wrong. Oh, totally wrong. Yes, where 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 it was the it was totally uh, what not what you expected. Uh, it's sort of a well, disappointment. Well, I mean, if I you know, a lot of that. these curiosity conversations, they worked well, and I, they would go on an hour and sometimes four or five hours. But I, when I met with Isaac Asimov, the most prolific science fiction writer, or at least one of them, perhaps the most. Um, after two minutes, his wife, who was also his psychiatrist, said, we're leaving. And I thought, I flew to New York, um, and he just, they just picked up and left. So that didn't go well. Um, I made movies where I thought, it's going to either be a smash hit or a flop. So I've had flops. I've never, <laughs> um, I've been su pleasant, pleasantly surprised by many of the hits. Um, one hit I thought would, would happen was Empire. 
I thought that would really, I was so passionate about that. And I thought people were so Ill, Ill informed about what it was. You know, they just judged it um, on the surface. And so uh, that was meteorically successful and it was, a gr it was great, you know, it was great because I, my mission, the mission was important to me. It was really important to me to make an all black television show on network TV because nobody would do it. And, um, you know, I started very early on getting to know Richard Pryor and then Eddie Murphy and I made seven movies with him and I, I just felt it was, there, there was, it's just something wasn't, was unfair. And so I wanted to try to do something about it. And I did that with Eminem on 8 Mile as well, something similar where the, the, the editor of the New York Times said to me, I think being, when people press buttons in you that, that make you want to prove them wrong, and that was one where he said, uh, I think that hip hop is an inferior subculture will soon fade. And I thought, I think you're wrong about this. <laughs> and. And, uh, but I wouldn't have known that had I not, I'm digressing, had I not met, not met old dirty bastard like 25 years ago. And I met him because it was just literally a curiosity conversation um, where it was Thursday and Friday was my deadline to myself. I better get somebody. And I was in New York making a movie and uh, actually it doesn't matter what movie, but <laughs> um, and I heard this guy that seems pretty crazy uh, talking to Howard Stern and he says don't you call me anything but old dirty bastard and I thought wow he's insisting on that as his name and I thought usually people run from that name so I thought I got to meet this guy which I did on Friday and I just was exposed to what I thought was was able to feel the truth of that and that uh it was like early stages of East Coast hip hop, and then I went on and just, uh, I went on a journey and met many others. Uh, That's interesting because, in a sort, in, in a sense, you made it a discipline, right? That you would systematically reach out to people. It could be in a restaurant, somebody you saw, I think, and uh, you know, or other types of people. Schedule meetings either ad hoc or call them if you heard about them, and then go and spend two or three hours in a conversation. Yeah, that's what I. I I'll be thinking of who, because I was trying to think of who I met last, thinking you might ask that question. I thought I'd better schedule something for next week. Um, but I, most recently, I met, I met an Uber driver that was really big. And I, I started asking him questions, which led to um, martial arts. I said, well, you must have, I'm sure you have other jobs. He said, I do. And I sa he said, you know, like security, some sort of security detail. Well, what is that? And that became kind of mysterious. Anyway, bottom line is he was Serbian and he's like 6'4", four, five maybe, and he knew of a martial arts, and I'd taken a few martial arts, um, but not this one. I never heard of it. It was called Sistema, and it was a very unusual martial arts, and I just said, listen, uh, would you, if I pay you, will you teach me? And he taught me this form of martial arts. So I... I'm pretty open-minded to stuff like that. It's not easy, but I would recommend that everybody do some, their own version of that. I think the good side of it is that you're supplementing the pitches that you get with those conversations. So it supplements the pattern. It makes it even more of a pattern in a sense. So you said that being a producer is like being an entrepreneur. And except that every single time, every single movie is you start from scratch. Again, so there's a big difference there. So uh, can you talk about the similarity that you see uh, in your journey to the journey that some founders here uh, could have? And Sure. So, well, first of all, you have to have a story. And I'm, I know that founders all, I believe they all have a story, even if it's just an idea, if, even if it's an idea or it's hardware, whatever it is, it's important to have an origin story. I, I know that. I, I strongly believe in that. Um, so a similarity would be you have to have a story, but more importantly, I found that in my movies that succeeded, they intersected with some universal theme. 
So my first movie, and this helped me a lot because it, I, I suffered so much humiliation over wanting to make a movie about a mermaid. So the first movie I really made was a, starring Tom Hanks, it was his first job, and acting job, and it was about Tom Hanks, a man falling in love with a mermaid. And it was thought to be the stupidest idea, like it, constantly rejection. These rejections were horrific because they weren't just like, no, we're not doing it. They'd say, just can you hold on one minute? So they could actually say something mean to me about it. <laughs> so weren't, they weren't satisfied just saying no. They actually had to go further and uh, you know break me down, humiliate me, just throw some barbs at me. So I just thought, well, there's got to be some commonality there uh, because I think all... I know, I, I think I believe that, um, and I believe that the, the ideas that most likely succeed and become unicorns are the ones that seem to be the most crazy. And, and they do, the theme often does eclipse the story. And I, I, I you know, I'm hesitant to say this in a crowd of, you know, founders and people that, that do this, uh, but I think, I think you just have to bet on the founder or the person with the vision because the, the journey will change all the time. And that's exactly what happens with all these movies. They start one way. The one thing that stays solid is the theme. So if it's about rooting for love or if it's uh, rooting for family, whatever, I can go through a few of the universal ones, but go to your next thought. Yeah, I mean, actually, in our business, we talk always about the narrative uh, you know, the, the need for a narrative, the need for a higher purpose in a sense, because if you just bore people with talking about your product and all that, it, it's really not, you know, the kind of thing that is inspiring for either investors or employees when you hire employees and all this, this ability to lead people with, with an idea. I think it's, that's where it's Yeah, I mean, similar. I think that you have to believe there's goodness in the thing that, that, that there's a glow of goodness in the thing that you're trying to make, that people are going to benefit. There's a win-win in the equation. And so, you know, I've chosen to make movies that, that try to do that, try to inspire people, that try to empower them. Um, you know, because ultimately, you know, in my business, which I don't know how this would equate, you can try this, but I'm in the feelings business, because absent the, me igniting feelings in human beings, um, there's really no reason to have that experience. Yeah, you know, I guess for a spectator, you need emotions, because it's hard to watch yeah. anything where there is no emotions. So I, I think it relates also to, to the viewer. Yeah, but, but going back, you know, curiosity is so essential. I mean, you know, I was fortunate enough to know Elon Musk very early on, and then it later came this callback of, I wanted to do something on Mars, a, you know, a docu-series. And he was kind enough to, you know, be involved in, in all aspects of it. And he said, we're doing it on Mars. But I thought to myself, it was my point of curiosity was, but, but why, why do we even want to go to Mars? He had gone so far beyond that, that answering that question would have been so benign that I had to kind of figure out around him and then ultimately validated by him the reasons to want to even go. Because, you know, the, any audience is going to want to know why I'm going and then if I'm there, what it is, or if, or if materials are going to be there, what those materials would be and why. So it's kind of essential to... Be, you know, to exercise this engine of curiosity. Well, I think Elon is a good example. I mean, I think that just watching a rocket take off in space give you goosebumps. You know, it's the, it's the kind of thing that reaches so deep in people that, that I think selling a vision like his is so inspiring, and I understand that. Yeah, no, it's pretty powerful. I don't know if anyone's been to SpaceX, but it's because being, the rockets are being made there. So... When there's a launch, the mission control, unlike Apollo 13, is right there in, that, in the plant. And it makes you cry because they're doing the countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and it's, their faces and fingers are against the glass, and it's unbelievable. The miracle of that is so powerful. He's done just 
such amazing things so quite so obviously oh yeah absolutely um so now now turning to how you work and how you shape a project i'm interesting so you you get involved early uh, with a director who has a certain vision uh and 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 i wonder how you get to modify or shape the vision with the director I and mean, basically how do you work with others creatively well, often the vision in my career, because of this, because of a mermaid movie, because the thing that I did first that seemed to be so stupid worked, I thought I'm going to stick with that formula. Um, the formula of if I like it, I mean, if it's penetrating my soul, um, I'm doing it. And and it becomes impregnated inside your psyche and it's quite kind of in, it, it, inescapable. I, I was looking at, because I had to see that reel for a minute and I thought, James Brown took 16 years, you know, like just, and then it found its way to Chad Bozeman who was perfect as James Brown. Um, so I think for me, I often have an, an idea or a vision and then I try to again, impregnate a director to make that vision cinematic. And then along the way, we have to find uh, the other ing creative ingredients to build it. So the first step is the vision or the story or the idea or the mission. And then there's the director that's gonna execute the mission once, it, once you begin the cinematic journey. And then there's post-production, there's all the other things, but there's actors you want, what are the things that matter about the actor? You know, in the case of Apollo 13, I was making a movie about astronauts, right? And um, so, I, so the studio gave, you, gave me a list, and I created a list of all these action stars, you know, whether it was Cruz or whether it was Costner. There was a whole group of action stars, and we're all ready to pull the trigger on one of those action stars. And I thought, but wait a second. This a movie, Apollo 13, we, the public, knows that they made it back safely. So who do we care about most in terms of saving them in outer space? Because that's what you're gonna have to convince people of. You're gonna have to engage them in something. And I thought, well, it's Tom Hanks. Everybody wants to save Tom Hanks. And so even though he didn't look like an astronaut, saving Tom Hanks was, seemed to be what we should be doing. Yeah. Simple. <laughs> and you saved him. <laughs> but. I also learned that, and I don't know if this is true in the foundational ingredients of the stuff that you do, but um, you know, within the ingredients, there's the writer, there's, there's different. So I found that counterpoint was essential. That hiring the obvious person as the number two in charge is not always the right decision. In fact, it's often not the right decision. So when I did the movie Eight Mile, I didn't know what director to hire. So I thought I should get those like super hip, like Hype Williams, or I can name all the, the hip video directors and stuff. That, that, and when I would meet with them, they knew everything about hip hop. But there was this flash moment where I realized, but the audience doesn't know everything about hip hop. And I don't know everything about hip hop. I know something, but I, I want, I want, someone that's really excited that has a beginner's mind so that is more of an archaeologist you know and so i think that's probably relevant in your business as well you want people that have so much excitem excitement that they're almost shocked you know they're 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 in awe of what's going on this journey as opposed to being kind of mundane so i learned like i said to dre avenge dr dre i said just I kept trying names on him. He goes, I don't know these people. He says, the only thing I know is don't clown out our world. And I thought, well, what does that mean? <laughs> so I thought, well, what it means is only do what's authentic. Don't make shit up. He said, only keep, the, keep everything real. If you, don't, if you keep everything real, no one's going to hurt you. And I think we, got, I think we pulled that part off. Wow. So you also actually wrote books, uh, two of them, who I read. <laughs> uh, one is uh, The Curious Mind, which relates pretty much to what we talked about in a sense, and the other one about making connections face-to-face, uh, -face, um, you know. And um, 
So in the book, there's one thing that comes out in, in both books, in a sense, is that curiosity, again, is, is, is kind of your superpower, in a sense, right? And you use curiosity for everything. It's like a muscle that you've developed. So I guess, so my question to you is, what is curiosity to you? Why do you define it? And how can you tell people in the audience that they could use that to their benefit in what they do? Because you, you've made it something from early on that, you know, got you where you are now. Well, you have to be obsessed. Um, I mean, there's shows on Uber the other night, uh, which Travis, we probably all of us know of Travis or know him. I know him. And, I mean, he's was a maniac, you know, like he's just had such a believer. But I shouldn't use that as an example. I think there's so many different founders that are become possessed in the same way I become possessed over an idea that I cannot not do it. I mean, it's, um, and then you get also the reputation of this guy will never stop. You throw him out the window, he comes in the chimney. If he, you throw him out the chimney, he comes in through a drainage pipe. I mean, that would be the way I would approach everything. Yeah, and, and then the other thing in your book... I mean, I think with curiosity, you have to be the kind of person that talks to themselves, um, where you ask and answer questions all day long. Um, you know, I don't know which, I mean, which movie to okay, say. If, did anyone see uh, A Beautiful Mind? Some people saw A Beautiful Mind. Okay. So, A Beautiful Mind was written, it was a, basically a drama that didn't start as a thriller. But I, I had this moment where I thought, wow, that's not going to be very engaging. You know, it's just this. To just start like a beginning, of, you know, an, or, or you know, they call they call them cradle to grave stories, you know, where it's just an or, simple origin story. I'm gonna have to find a way to create some propulsion in this, so it has tremendous urgency. And I had had a curiosity with a woman named Veronica De Negri uh, 30 years before that, and 25 years before that. And she was tortured in Chile for 18 months unpredictably. And I had this chance meeting with her, and I started to ask her, like, how did you survive the torture? And the way she told me she survived was be, by creating, by living in an alternate reality, an alternate world, and live in that story so that she could survive the torture and prevail. And that became the beginning of what a beautiful, mind, a beautiful mind was because, of course, schizophrenics have multiple dimensions or realities they're living in, so we started it in a whole different reality. So I think when you pay attention to people, you get yourself out of your comfort zone, and you listen to people and talk to them, but really go deep. You know, I have this thing, about, I wrote a book on eye contact, you know. I was, was gonna ask you the question. It was called Face to Face, The Art of Human Connection. And it's basically, I, I just hypothesized that eye contact is the Wi-Fi of human connection. And I think, I don't know if any of you are able to, to raise money if you're not looking at somebody and not distracted. You have to be present and you, you know, it's gotta be your best date ever, you know? So I always thought, that's how I approach these curiosity conversations. I want to have my best date ever with this physicist or, you know, any of the people that, that I've, I've met over time. Yeah, that's really your other superpower in the sense of saying, I mean, reading your books, it's about this connection, eye to eye, really focusing on someone, listening to them. And then, of course, the curiosity side. Yeah, because curiosity and doing what we're talking about is not a transaction. And you can tell when you're talking to somebody that's just, you know, just, just hitting, you know, like an assault weapon, just hitting you with questions. But there are people that go slowly or they, they, send, they spend time breaking down or unpacking one sentence. And that's usually the conversation you remember the best. Well, I, I think a lot of, founders would find here that given the parallels between the movie industry and, and our industry, 
it's some of the, it's, it's the exact same thing. It's pattern recognition, it's curiosity, it's focusing on people, it's listening to people, it's hiring. Well, it's case the right building team. too, isn't it? Case I mean, building. Yeah. I mean, on all sides of the, the equation, you're, somebody's having to build a case. You're building a case to get that be, that that founder that that everybody else is chasing, or is case building for the founder to get you. To some invest. extent, there is one thing that's a bit harder, I think, in your business is that, as you said, it's. it's Every time it's a new company, it's one movie. Once it's made, it's made. Either it's going to do well or not. Uh, whereas I think startups have the benefit of being able to pivot along the way. Maybe you can pivot during the movie, but once it's in the box, it's, that's it. Whereas in the case of startups, I mean, they have many more years ahead of, and they tend to yeah. have more of this opportunity to pivot, which, which is probably harder in your business. Well, it's harder for movies, but in television series, you can do it. Yeah. And in docu-series, because we do many of those, I'm doing one on the NFL through the lens of the New England Patriots. I'm doing one on, with Nike that uh, focuses on just do it. Um, and so you can change those. You can, that's why documentaries and series are kind of great, because you can iterate upon them constantly. But movies, are when they're done, they're kind of done. Well, Brian, thank you so much sure. for your time. It was very informative. <laughs>